don't consider it a mega million dollar contract. We see it as a 160 month stimulus package. Fernando Tatis's mega mega deal with the San Diego Padres. Hi everyone, this is Willow Tool welcoming you to another edition of Park Bridge Sports History. And of course this week, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the big time contract awarded to or earned uh, by Fernando Tatis Jr. of the San Diego Padres. And I'd like to take a look at this. You know, uh, welcome everybody and thank you again for allowing me into your homes. Uh, this week, when this came over the wires, Howard Fredericks contacted me uh, immediately and said, Man, did I see this? And I wasn't taking, I, I, well, let me preface this. His email was about, really was the focus about the number of years. Of course, Tatis, I think, is going to be 22 this year. So the length of the contract will bring him to age 36, which, of course, is, you know, past prime in uh, most uh, major league sports. However, I was really taken aback, not so much the years, because I actually think it was a smart deal in this respect, locking up. Uh, one of your going to be one of your franchise players for a number of years and having him with your franchise so that he becomes the face of the club. But I was just taken aback by the millions, $340 million. And then I was starting to look and I did recall, of course, they have Machado at 300 million. So they have over half a billion dollars well over half a billion dollars wrapped up in two players who, uh, as the uh, course of the contract uh, goes on, they're probably going to be moved out of two very uh, important positions, third base and shortstop, and moved, of course, to the other side of the diamond, first base and probably the outfield. So that's a ton of green that you're giving to two young stars. And San Diego, of, uh, of course, is still looking for their uh, first world championship. Of course, they've got two pennants, but that really pales in comparison to winning uh, the big one overall. Now, why I, I'm talking about this week is that when <laughs> Howard and I went back and forth, uh, and of course, I am no financial whiz. I've never owned a business per se where I've had to meet payroll. But I got to be honest with you, there should be no, uh, no, no excuse anymore for any of the teams complaining about being small market status. You got two players that you've given half over half a billion dollars to over the length of a contract, even if that were, let's say, uh, 10 years each guy. You know, you're talking and I'm just going to make it, let's say, Machado, 30 you know, three hundred million. Let's say over ten years, that's thirty million dollars. That's sixty million dollars that you have wrapped up each year in two players. And as I expressed to Howard, I'm saying I don't know where they're going to come up with the money to pay for this. And then you start to realize, is it really just a big Ponzi scheme by the owners? Because they're the ones who constantly say, "Hey, I'm in a small market. I can't compete." And yet you have two of the largest contracts uh, in baseball history in San Diego, a franchise that is seen as, even though it's in California, it's still seen as a small market uh, franchise. And it obviously pales, I guess, in population, metropolitan size to, you know, its rivals up, up the street, 100 and some odd miles, L.A., and to a certain extent, maybe the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, along with San Jose up in Northern California. But still, I mean, that is a lot of cabbage you're giving to two players. And um, I'm going to go back to this, but I, I really wanted to focus on something. I, I didn't think I gave three great players last week. Of course, I did, as uh, anybody who followed the show last week, I found, uh, or a guy working around my house found a number of old baseball cards. It wedged in my my wall, and when he uh, pulled them out, 
it was like a treasure trove, a real nostalgia type of thing. I mean, Ned Garver, we talked about him in length last week, 20-game winner with the St. Louis Browns. Ray Herbert, an all-star pitcher. Uh, Johnny Briggs, no, not the one from Patterson. This one was a pitcher for the Cubs about five years in Major League Baseball. Fred King, the last uh, living member of both the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees. And, of course, uh, Bobby Adams, who had a all-star season with the Cincinnati Reds, even though this was the Cubs. And as I said, most of the players either came from the Cubs or another terrible team of the late 50s. So uh, the kid probably who hid these was either ashamed or didn't really care about the players. But he did leave one card in particular, which I loved. And it was called Aptly Destruction Crew. And it has two cusp Hall of Fame players in Minnie Minoso and Rocky Calavito. And, of course, uh, Hall of Famer. And the second player ever, uh, African-American, to play in the major leagues, Larry Doby. Interesting thing. And this is why I said I, I, I thought time constraints. I ran out of time last week to talk or, or delve into these three legit all-stars. Uh, from this treasure trove of cards that I found. But Larry Doby was also interesting. People don't realize this. Not only was this, he the second African-American to play in the Major League Baseballs following Jackie Robinson, he was ironically also the second African-American manager. But he followed another Robinson, Frank Robinson. And, of course, he did it with the White Sox uh, as a manager, I think back in, I'm going to say 77 or 78. And of course, Frank became uh, the manager of the Cleveland Indians in 1976. In fact, we talked about that because in his very first game, he hit a home run to help uh, the tribe win uh, a ball game. And, uh, you know, Frank had a pretty good managerial career. Uh, he, he, listen, his teams were always intense, very competitive, just never got a really good team really to work with. Uh, he had the Cleveland Indians. He had the Montreal Expos. He had San Francisco for a while. I do believe he may have even managed Washington. Here's the team I would love to have seen him with. And he did manage, I believe, Baltimore. I would love to have seen uh, Frank Robinson go back and manage Cincinnati because I think he actually would have done a fantastic job with the Reds because back in the 80s, they had some still some decent teams. 1981, uh, they got the Royal hack job by baseball because that was the strike shortened season. And in both instances, the Reds finished second in the National League West, but they had the best overall record of National League West teams over the span of 108 games that they played that year. And they always, they and St. Louis, uh, what they sh really should have done was just expand the playoffs that year. Uh, but Bowie Kuhn and the rest of baseball was not thinking. The Reds, to make it short and sweet, the Reds uh, never made the playoffs there. And really, the next year, that was really their, their swan song because the next year the Reds finished in last place. Their only highlight that year in 82 was that head, Dave Concepcion was the MVP of the All-Star game held in Montreal. He had a home run and a, I think a single and a 4-1 win. This is just stuff I can remember off the top of my head being a big Red fan. But uh, regardless, I just would love to go over their careers because uh, I was trying to make a point with Minoso how I, I really thought that he should have been and he should still be considered. And I think he will get eventually in. Uh, one of the things that I always loved about Minoso was how many different uh, numbers he actually had. He was basically number nine, but he also wore number 18 and 16. He was a nine-time All-Star, a three-time gold glove, and uh, one of the few players from Cuba. And uh, along with, guy, off the top of my head, Tony Perez, uh, Cuban Hall of Famer. Cuban American Hall of Famer, but Minoso really has a plethora of of stats. I, I I didn't get into this the other day, but I never realized, and this is why I, I thought I was a little short 
on this. So I, like I said, I'd like to spend a little time on this. Didn't realize this. Minoso led the league in hit by pitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten times. You know, we talk about Ron Hunt, 1971. He got hit by 50 pitches. Or even Craig Biggio, uh, who I believe is the all-time hit by pitch uh, master. But here's Minoso. Man, getting plunked so many times. You know, if you get plunked, uh, as he did, a, a career high, 23 times in 1956, that's incredible. You know, that's an additional 23 times you're on base. But imagine what that's doing to your body. Now, I know that Ron Hent, uh did set the single season record in 71. I think it was 50 hit by pitches in one year. And anybody who saw Ron Hunt play, and I'm sure – uh, as I'm speaking, Howard does remember. I mean, he was way up on the plate, and he was the first Met, I do believe, to start an All-Star game, ironically, at Shea Stadium in 64. So even the Mets uh, had him. And I remember 64, uh, an article, well, not in 1964, but there was an article just recently either in the Post or the Daily News. Uh, they went back and found Ron Hunt. I think he's a farmer out in Missouri. And it was really a nice story about a guy who's really a footnote player. And I'll take that. Imagine being a footnote player in baseball history, at least for the hit by pitches. Uh, another famous guy who was uh, noted for hit, being hit by pitches was, of course, Don Baylor, MVP of 1979, with the California Angels. Although, to this day, I always thought it should have been Ken Singleton who should have been the MVP in 1979 for the uh, Baltimore Orioles. Regardless, uh, number of times he led the league in steals. This is Minoso three times. And people don't realize this. He came back to baseball at the age of 50 in 1976 and actually played. I always thought it was just one game. Actually, Bill Vack had him play three games. He was actually one for eight and uh, with two strikeouts. But uh, – he did pretty good. One for eight. Not bad in three games. Oh, and then once again, he comes back in 1980. And the whole promotion was that he would be a five or a four decade man because he actually started in 49, played throughout the 50s and 60s, actually a five decade man, then returned in 1976 for a game. And of course, in 1980, at the age of 54, he goes 0 for 2. So his return to glory, he goes a combined one for 10, does play in five games. Now, that's a little bit on the cheap. Vec totally did it for publicity. I also think he did it as a reward for uh, Minoso's years of service to uh, the White Sox and the Indians. Uh, if you recall, Vec owned both teams. But uh, it was... You know, for the White Sox who stunk in the early or in the late 70s, early 80s, they were just starting to get good. Uh, it was a needed uh, piece of baseball history and also great publicity and a tribute. And the other thing I think Vec was really trying to do was uh, stir some interest in Minoso for the Hall of Fame because he kept coming up short. I think the highest he got. Uh, was I think he might have gotten 54% in his last year of eligibility. But to me, uh, his stats, 1690, 298, on a, based on 162 games, uh, over a 17-year career. Now, it's really 15 because I think they also included baseball reference, the two games that or, or the – six games that he played age 50 and 54. So over 15 years, he's an outfielder. He'll give you 1690, 298. Not bad. All right. Uh, basically his RBIs are higher than Pete Rose, a little lower batting average than Pete Rose, 16 home runs. Uh, I think that was a high for Pete Rose in 1970. And this is not a knock against Rose. But you're talking about the same, I should, well, the same type of player. Not enormous power, but line drive, line drive uh, hitting ability to all fields. Good base runner. Uh, scored a lot of runs. Actually, 
they list them as scoring on the average 100 runs a season, something Minoso could do because he scored over 100 uh, or more than 90 runs, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times in his career. Would have been a 10th, he had 89. So let's just say 10 because he had 91 and 89. I'm making it at even 10. 10 times he scored 90 runs in his career. And as far as MVP, three times he finished fourth. And just incredible. And did win a couple of gold, gold gloves three times. So you're not talking about a, a player who's on the cup because it's interesting. I was just watching Baseball Network the other day, and now there is renewed interest in a guy I've been harping for. I told you he's Richie Allen or Dick Allen double, and that's Gary Sheffield. All of a sudden, people are rediscovering his stats. And, I, and as I mentioned on this show, I think one of the reasons why uh, Sheffield is not in the Hall of Fame is because he doesn't have an anchor team. Even though he has, uh, you know, he played just like Allen for a number of different teams, uh, played third, first in the outfield. Uh, just an amazing, amazing player, but just is overlooked. And I think it's because he doesn't have that one anchor team that uh, players and writers can affiliate him to to give him a little bit more legitimacy. All right. Same thing probably happened to Daryl Evans. Great on base percentage, big. He is the quintessential player of today, Daryl Evans. Take a look at his stats. Over 400 home runs, a ton of walks, a great on-base percentage, played third, first, uh, did play for the 84 uh, world champion Detroit Tigers. Maybe not the greatest of defensive players, but in today's metrics, he would be a highly valuable player, uh, a Jim Tome type player. Although, obviously, Tom, 600 home runs, a much better player overall. Probably a, a, a higher average hitter, too, as well. Evans was like 248. So he would go one for four home run and a walk. You know, that type. Good production, though. I mean, I would take it today. I'm sure that 90% of uh, major league player, uh, players would have that as a career. And also, teams would love to have a guy like Evans on their team today. But... That was Minoso's stats. Led the league three times in triples, led in hits once, led in games 154, 1960. Remember that they don't go to 162 until uh, really the latter stages of Minoso's career. And I always think about that because if you think about it, he played 154, 148, 149, 153, 151, 139, 153, 151. So he was basically an Iron Man. So if if you talk about those eight additional games, I, I'm going to say this: he would probably have played in them. And you're talking about ten years. That's another half season. So instead of let's say uh, having 173 hits. Uh, or 1,963 hits for his career, probably has easily over 2,000. He probably has 200 home runs, and he probably has uh, 1,100 steals and probably uh, probably 1,100 RBIs over in, in his career. So those eight extra games, people don't realize that, but – don't think of it as eight being minuscule. Think about it over the life of a player's career. You know, if you play 20 years, you're playing an additional season today. And obviously adding on to your stats. A guy 20 years, you know, who, who played 20 years back in the 40s and 50s, uh, statistically, you've robbed him of one year. Now, we know, all know that the game has changed and we have to – Put it in context and stuff, but just imagine you're having a great year as one of those players, like I just mentioned, Minoso, right? That's 80 extra games. Even in his worst stretch of 80 games, he would still he would still add on lifetime to his career hits, RBIs, and home runs. So it, it could have greatly affected him. All right, let's go to Rocky Calavito real quick. Uh, Calavito, of course, he was, uh, without a doubt, 
uh, a Cleveland favorite. And of course, he gets traded in 1960 to the Detroit Tigers. We actually went on about that. Uh, he he was traded for uh, uh, Detroit's Harvey Keen, who had had a great season. But Harvey Keen, if you take a look, he's more like Pete Rose than Minnie Minoso. And uh, certainly not two different, completely different outfielders, Harvey Keen and Rocky Calavito. But Calavito still had a very productive uh, career. I kind of look at him as, uh, if you remember guys like Bobby Allison, I know he's a better player than Allison. I'm just trying to think of guys uh, of today uh, that he would be close to. Well, they would be big power guys with uh, a decent average, 266. He had a pretty good on-base percentage, 359. You know, he does draw. Calavito walked 75 or more times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven seven times in his career and the other two times for an even 10 he had 71 walks uh respectively in each each uh season so you're talking about a guy who could get on base either with a home run or a walk he had a cannon for an arm in fact he pitched in the major leagues i'm not saying that he was lights out but he does go on the mound for the indians and i think as well for the tigers but take a look at this he finished in the MVP voting one, two, three, four times in the top 10, and then an additional two times. 20, he finished 23rd in 1964 while a member of the Kansas City A's. His one year with the A's, interestingly enough, he went 34, 102, and hit 274 and managed uh, 23 uh, to finish 23rd uh, in the MVP that year. In fact, in 64, uh, he finished. Brooks Robinson won his only MVP uh, in 1964, and I guarantee you this. I wonder. No, I would say that Robinson probably has the higher WAR. Uh, Robinson that year, 64, had an eight WAR, 8.1. Dean Chance, remember him? 8.7. That was a guy very similar, I believe, to Nolan Ryan, except that he burnt out and Ryan was able. He had an not one of my favorite pitchers, certainly an incredible specimen as a pitcher. And what I mean is this, I've, I'm not knocking uh, Nolan Ryan, but I always felt that there were better pitchers that I had more confidence in winning game seven. I'll start right here and end right here. Bob Gibson, who's a contemporary of uh, Nolan Ryan, Tom Seaver, Jim Palmer, Juan Marichal, Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale. Uh, even a little bit later, Steve Carlton. All right. Uh, these are guys, uh, maybe even Don Sutton. These are guys that I would give the ball to before I give it to, or would have given it to uh, Nolan Ryan, only because of his inconsistency. You know, the interesting thing is when Ryan really, as he got older, his ERA went down, so did his walks. His control got much, much better as he got older obviously, but, uh, and his winning percentage was much better as he got older. Uh, and he was basically, well, I'm not saying he was saddled with terrible teams, but I think I did a little study on, on, uh, on Ryan and Seaver and found that Ryan actually played on a higher percentage of uh, a higher winning percentage ball clubs over his career than Tom Seaver did. Uh, but that was, Arguably, it was later in his career with the Houston's and uh, Texas and all the rest of it. But nevertheless, Robinson finished first in the 64 MVP. Uh, interesting that I'm just going to give you this. Uh, Rocky Calavito had a 4-1 war that year. Not the lowest, but certainly not in the stratosphere of Brooks Robinson. That's why I'm saying it was really... Uh, Brooks is probably his greatest season was 1964, statistically speaking. Uh, probably most of that war was – well, he did have a good season, 28-118, 3-17. But I am sure that most of that war was earned from his splendid defense. All right, and then the last player of, of the trio, of course, is Larry Doby. 
Here's what I really wanted to say about Doby. Great ball player. Came up late in his career. I think he was 26 when he finally uh, got his breakthrough in the major leagues. So you're talking about uh, Bill James likes to say it at age 27, or that's what the metrics is. That's your prime year for being a baseball player. So he comes up a year before that. As I mentioned last week, he had 32 home runs twice to lead the league. He does lead the league in MVP. Probably should have been the MVP in 1954 because the Indians – we're just, it's amazing. The, how would you like to be a, a team? And no love loss for the Yankees when I say this. They actually won 103 games in 1954 and finished in second place. But not just finished in second place, finished a distant second to the Cleveland Indians who won 111. They finished eight games back and they had 103 wins in a 154 game season. That's incredible. The only thing the uh, Yankees got out of it was that uh, Yogi Berra wins his MVP. I think that might have been his second MVP. Let me just check because he does win three. I just want to see when he won. Uh, he actually won. Yes, that was his second because he wins the next year, his last one. Berra, incredible. MVP, finished third. Won it, fourth, second, won it, won it, second. All right. Seven times he finished in the top four. Top four. And then, of course, he goes his whole career. Every year he has an MVP vote with the exception of 1946 when he got seven games and, of course, late in his career, uh, 62, 63, and 64. I don't, I don't even count those. But – from 1947 to 1961, he was in the MVP hunt and finished in the top, oh man, it's just incredible, top 15, one, two, three, three times, four times, five times in the top 15, in addition to one, two, one, one, three, and four. That's incredible. Incredible. I don't even know if Willie Mays was able to do that. All right. Regardless, 1954, he wins the MVP, uh, has a lower war than Larry Doby. Actually, Doby had a 5'7. Uh, Yogi's was 5'3. Now, uh, here's really the reason why Doby doesn't win it. And he probably should have. Here's the problem. Ready? You know who finished third in the MVP? And I did bring this up Bobby Avila who was Doby's uh, teammate and second baseman. Ready? You know who finished fourth? Minnie Minoso, a future, a future teammate of Larry Doby. He had actually an 8-2 war, Minnie Minoso, uh, playing with the White Sox. You know who finished fifth? Yep, Bob Lemon. Uh, so certainly uh, – his MVP was probably soured by the fact that he had two teammates ahead of him in the MVP voting. And then, you know, who finished sixth early win. Who also got you a lot of late wins as well, but he finished uh, with a 5.5 uh, war and then ready for this. Ted Williams finished seventh. His war was 7.5. Oh, man. Here's Ted Williams for a guy with a 7-5 war. All right. Now you're talking about Ted Williams. He had a terrible year. Gee, where did you hear that before from me? I think I was talking about Hank Aaron a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Ted Williams had a terrible year. He only played 117 games. Definitely, uh, I believe he got hurt. I don't know if this was the All-Star game he got hurt, but he was hurt. Remember, he, he damaged his elbow. He might have even broken it in uh, one of the All-Star games. Maybe it was in Comiskey Park in 1950. But Williams <laughs> in 1954, pff, terrible year. Ready? 29-89-345. And that is reduced to a 7.5 war. 
And that's a terrible year for Ted Williams. It's incredible. Some of these great all-time players, what we would consider mega million deals, these guys are having terrible years with 29, 89, and 345. Uh, just incredible. And then to finish out the top 10, Harvey Keen, Detroit, Nellie Fox, another White Sox. And then Mickey Vernon for the Washington Senators. Mickey Vernon had a 3.6 war. See, this is what I mean. He was 20, 97, and 290. So obviously, this is how you have to think of the war, or at least I would there. If I'm pitting Williams versus Vernon, I'm saying, all right, Williams hit 55 points higher as a batting average, uh, nine more home runs, but eight fewer RBIs, yet basically you could argue that his war is double that of Mickey Vernon's. So this is what I mean about this war. It's useful, but not useful. It seems to be inconsistent, except this. <laughs> when you come to Ted Williams and you say, this is the brilliance of the all-time great players, even in one of their bad years, their war is still twice as good as guys who are having career <laughs> So that is uh, Larry Doby, just another terrific ball player. Uh, and he had a 49-3 uh, war. And this is what I mean. Sheffield is higher. And so is Richie Allen or Dick Allen. Higher wars, obviously. Statistically, uh, 283 for Doby. I know that uh, 292 for Richie Allen or Dick Allen. I love calling them both, by the way, because it's it's amazing. He becomes he goes from Richie Allen 1971 to Dick Allen 1972 and wins the MVP in 72. And arguably, Dick Allen probably would have won the MVP in 73 had he not gotten hurt, although that was Reggie's great quintessential year uh, in the major leagues. Now, just getting back. So that was the transition. I hope you enjoyed. I know I went back. There were some days that – really the show what I want to get to. And as I've said to everybody who watches the show, I do go off on tangents, but I want you to realize it's, uh, I want you, it's supposed to be a fun, relaxing type of thing. We're out for a couple of beers, talking all things sports, getting our, our minds off the real world. And these are things that you think about. I, I, I mean, I'm looking at that C, that wishbone C, and immediately I think of the Cincinnati Reds. And that uh, they, that the Indians and the Reds both had the same C, although in different colors. And I really like that wishbone C. And then I start to think, gee, I wonder who had the, the wishbone C first, Bears or the Reds? I'm sure it's the Reds because you got to remember that C, which is distinctive on the Bears helmet, they didn't have, they didn't have the stickers on the helmets until, you know, late middle 60s and stuff. And I'd love to do that again. Best helmets. And we'll go over that again. I don't have best logos. I did that already earlier for uh, the NFL. But there are some helmets that are pretty cool in the NFL. Uh, and we need to address that. Even baseball hats and all the rest of it. Although I still think this, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of emails about this. I still think the Cardinals have the best uniform in baseball over the Yankees. There's something really cool about the two birds on the baseball bat, the way that Cardinals is written across. Uh, definitely like it. Obviously, I like their home uniforms. I don't. I didn't like, speaking of the Cardinals, I didn't like when they had the blue helmets, uh, the blue uh, baseball hats of the 60s. I really like that Cardinal red that they wore uh, 1967, 68, and that they wear today. Um, and I like the 69 Cardinal logo, the one that uh, they use. Sometimes they have the ones from the 40s, but I really like those Cardinal uniforms from the 60s. That's why I think they're the best. Plus, they're not pinstriped. And I do like pinstripes, but I don't want every team to be in pinstripes. Every once in a while, it was cool to see the Reds, let's say, wear the pinstripes or the, or the Pirates wear the pinstripes, but there are just certain teams that should be in pinstripes, the Yankees, the Mets. You know, the interesting thing is with the Mets, 
they have the pinstripes and the uniforms were a combination of the Giants and the Dodgers. And for the life of me, I don't believe either team, even in a retro or even in a new uh, uniform uh, for a certain year, has ever worn pinstripes. Maybe uh, old time baseball fans of the Dodgers and the New York Giants could uh, illuminate me on that. But I don't believe either team ever wore the pinstripes. And here are the Mets, and they do. That royal blue uh, pinstripe of the 60s. I really like that. Anyway, let's get back to my main focus today. Oh, here's another. Well, I'll save that. And that is uh, the Pirate, uh, excuse me, the Padres giving out a massive, massive uh, contract to uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. And of course, the big thing right now is uh, the two teams that actually have, as we go into this, and maybe I'll do a, a preseason preview of the major leagues. Uh, without a doubt, Toronto, who uh, I really, uh, I, I must say, I've gotten on their bandwagon over the last year because I see so many similar things. Now, I know they've gotten rid of some of their younger pitchers. Uh, Mets picked up a couple. And, of course, I'm, I'm losing my mind on that. But basically, I'm looking at the Blue Jays as having a core four uh, all Seems to be the core four all have one thing in, in common, and that is their dads played in the major leagues. And I'm talking about Biggio and Bobo. Uh, and now the name is escaping me, but there are four players uh, with the Blue Jays. Dads all played in the major leagues, and they seem to be the heart and soul of that Toronto team. And, of course, as I say this, I'll, I'll probably uh, remember because the one guy who I'm thinking of it sounds like a Star Wars name, and that's why I really like him. And I think, oh, Bichette, Bobo Bichette. I really think of the four, uh, he may be the best hitter of the four. Maybe not the best all-round player, uh, but that might be Guerrero. But of the four, I actually think he's probably the most mature of the hitters. Regardless, those four guys have a ton <coughs> of pressure on them this year. And now the Padres are not just expected to contend. They are not just expected to win, but they are expected to win the whole thing. Maybe not this year and maybe not next year, but within three years. And the Padres have really, now there are many small market teams today are probably cursing the Padres because they are maybe potentially exposing that there's no such thing as a small market team. You've got $600 million locked up in two players over the next 10, 12 years. And putting that kind of money, only the Yankees have done that. I mean, uh, I'm going to show you something here. This is the top salaried players in the major sports today. (laughs) And most of them, are baseball players. And uh, I got it from uh, a website. I cannot recall what it is. It's not baseball reference or anything like that. But here's the top, of course, Mahomes, $450 million contract. Now, Kansas City's gotten one Super Bowl championship and an appearance out of that contract. Well, I can't even say out of that contract because he wins the Super Bowl last year, then signs the mega deal. And they get <laughs> to the Super Bowl this year. Where really, let's let's face it, they were taken to school by Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. They were never in that game. And there might have been a couple of things off the field that did influence that, but they were never in that game. And I got to be very honest with you, Brady looked like typical Brady, as we talked about on, on, on the show. But Mahomes, he looked like a... a, a an inexperienced quarterback out there and he's got talent. There's no question. I kind of like the gunslinging and it, 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 uh, kind of the gunslinging, uh, look to his play because I think that the NFL so, so often is stodgy corporate, even in their approach to how they play football, you know, everything is done robotically and Mahomes seems to be, wow. Uh, he would be doing the same thing if they were playing, <laughs> you know, on the on uh in the street or 
you know, in, in the lots. So he, he does have talent. He's got uh, charisma. There's no question, but nevertheless, he only has a Super Bowl appearance for the $450 million. Now that may be over the life. And so, and of course too, you got to remember this, unlike baseball, the football uh, contracts are not guaranteed. Now I'm not saying that that 450 million, probably a third of that 150 million is right now in um, Mahomes' bank account or soon to be, but it's not the same guarantees in the NFL that you have in baseball. Next guy, Mike Trout, $430 million. I really thought for baseball's sake, I had said this, and of course Machado uh, kind of spoiled that and so did Bryce Harper. I really believe that baseball needed uh, certain players in the next 10 to 15 seasons to really become anchor or franchise uh, players for a particular team. Mike Trout seemed to, uh, or, or the Angels actually believe that, uh, you could argue, by signing Trout to a $430 million contract and really making him the face of that franchise. I really thought that the Senators were going to do the same thing with Bryce Harper and that the uh, Orioles would do the same thing with Machado, but neither did. did. So, uh Interestingly enough, that it's Trout, 430. Then the next guy who I was just talking about is Bryce Harper, 330 million, followed by this two Yankees, Giancarlo Stanton, 325, and Jared Cole, 324. So even the Yankees, $600 million wrapped up in those two players. Machado, 300 million. Nolan Arenado. And we can see what Colorado thought about that because they. Traded him to the Cardinals, another great move by the Cardinals, and they are paying some of that salary of $50 million. And then the last two, Miguel Cabrera, $248 million. I guess the Tigers are happy that they signed him, but you can see that he's a, his old age starting to creep in on that contract and is hurting them. And then Anthony Rendon, $245 million uh, with uh, as he signed and left – uh, Washington. So interesting. In those 10 guys, you have about what? 11, 17, 20, 22, 24, 26. <sighs> Amazing. $2.6 billion. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. Thank you again for letting me come into your homes and talk nothing but sports. See you next time.